Uh, welcome to the last session of the first day. Uh, I'm Jung Hee Chan from Seoul National University. Uh, this session is about fully homomorphic encryption. The first talk is sanitization of FHE ciphertext. Uh, it's by Leo Duca and Damian Stelle. Leo will present. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so yes, I'm going to speak about sanitization of uh, fully homomorphic uh, ciphertext. Um, the subtitle for the talk is How to do your laundry homomorphically. So how to clean your ciphertext whiter than white. So uh, what is it about? Um, so let's review quickly what FHE do. So Alice wants Bob to compute something for her, but she wants to keep her privacy. So she wants uh, her data to remain uh, uh, private, even though Bob's computing for her. She will send a bunch of ciphertext, so encryption of several messages, and Bob uh, should apply a circuit C to those ciphertexts. Let's say those, let's say those ciphertexts are uh, binary. He wants, he needs to compute a binary circuit on the plain text, but only has the ciphertext. And homomorphic encryption allows this. So given the public key of a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, uh, you can evaluate the circuit uh, homomorphically here. So it means that you will apply um, transparently the circuit to the plain text, even if you only know the ciphertext. And when he's done doing this, well, he sends back the ciphertext to Alice. Alice decrypt, and she must decrypt what uh, would have been the direct application of the circuit C to uh, uh, messages. All right. So in more involved scenario, we might want both Alice and Bob to keep some privacy. Uh, because in the previous uh, version, we had no guarantee that the ciphertext that Bob was computing would remain private. And so in this scenario, it's slightly different. Uh, well. The protocol is pretty much the same, but the circuit that Bob's evaluates is his circuit, and he really wants to keep this private. Um, so why would we want this? Well, we have several uh, scenarios where, where it could be useful. So for example, if Bob is an online company and he has like a very good algorithm uh, that he wants to make profit off by uh, selling a basically computation, but it's computing on, uh, um, on data that are sensitive and that also needs to remain private. Uh, so two examples are following. For example, uh, a company that would want to optimize pricing or supply chain uh, strategies. Uh, and Damien has also this very nice example that uh, maybe he is actually Alice and Bob is this fiscal optimization consultant. Um, so here is uh, the outline of my talk. Uh, we're going to describe an efficient way uh, to obtain this circuit privacy out of uh, existing fully homomorphic encryption scheme. So I'll go over some definition. I'll present very quickly the existing approach, which is called floating. And then we will present uh, our contribution, um, which is the better approach, which we call soak, spin, and repeat. And very quickly, I will show you some application uh, in practice uh, for efficiency and conclude. So what is precisely ciphertext sanitization? Well, we want that there exists an algorithm sanitize that when we apply to a ciphertext, the first property that we want is correctness. So we want that it doesn't modify the underlying plain text. So we want that the description of sanitize of C be the same thing as the decryption of C. And the second property is that if we want that two ciphertexts that actually decrypt to the same value, so two ciphertexts that have the same underlying plain text are statistically indistinguishable. And we want this even knowing the secret and the public key. So that's uh, might be strange uh, when, you, when you come from uh, public key cryptography. Here we want a security property to hold even with the knowledge of the secret key. But you remark that here we define a notion that is statistical. So we could have a variant of uh, sanitization where it is only guaranteed to happen computationally, but 
for the way we know how to achieve this, we, we, we can actually have this stronger notion of statistical indistinguishability. So the delta that you see here just denotes uh, the, the statistical distance between those two distributions. Um, in this old talk, I will only speak of uh, a weak um, model uh, in, the, in the honest but curious model. So Alice is honest but curious. It means that she does not deviate from the uh, regular uh, protocol and the way she will construct the public key and the ciphertext, uh, she will do that by the book. She will not modify the protocol. Um, if you want to upgrade this to um, malicious, uh, to resistance to, to malicious adversary, uh, there, there, is, uh, there are generic techniques uh, to achieve that from uh, honest but curious uh, security. So do we really need to do this? Um, uh, do FHE as we know them actually reveal some information about the, the circuit that was used to evaluate uh, the, the ciphertext, the final ciphertext? Well, this is the case because those ciphertexts have those noise components and depending on the type of operation that we perform inside FHE, the noise will get larger. So if we do a lot of operation, the noise will get larger and especially multiplication. Um, so for example, if one computation involves a lot of addition, and another computation involves a lot of multiplication, then the noise at the end of the, uh, the operation that used multiplication would be larger. Uh, and not only, not only this, the, the, the noise component of the product of two ciphertexts might actually depend on the underlying plain text. So the noise at the end of the computation does not only depend just on the shape of the circuit, but might depend on intermediate values on the circuit. So there is potential for leaking information there, but um, it, it might be easy to construct simple example where some information leaks. Um, so the current approach to tackle this issue is called noise flooding. So we start from a ciphertext that comes from a very small uh, space, which we call C in. So the ciphertext space before flooding. And what we're going to do is that we're going to add some noise to this ciphertext, much more noise than what it already has. So here I'm adding some blue noise to this point here on the bottom right. And after this noise, so the, the, the ciphertext might be anywhere in this blue area. And if I do the same thing now with yellow noise to the other point here, I get this yellow region and the intersection is the green region. And the argument uh, to, to, to claim that this is secure is to say that, well, after we add those noise, everything that falls in this green region well, it could equally have come from the first ciphertext or for the from the second one, or actually from any ciphertext inside this region. So, but if, if we need to, to fill in parameters, then we see that it's not exactly efficient because for this argument to work, we need the remaining area, this blue portion that is not caught by, any ci by every ciphertext and this yellow portion, we need those portions to be relatively negligible to the final, um, to, the f to, the, to the green portion, actually. And to do this, we need that the, the final, uh, uh, the final uh, space, uh, sorry, final ciphertext space C out, we need it to be much larger than the input ciphertext, actually exponentially larger if you want to resist any sub-exponential attacks. And this has bad influence on the parameters. So first, in the security perspective, you require uh, a much more aggressive learning with error assumption. Um, so you will, more, more technically, you would need uh, learning with error assumption for sub-exponential approximation factor, which is not the vanilla uh, polynomial uh, approximation factor LWE assumption. But it also has effect on the, on the concrete parameters, well, on the asymptotic parameters and even more on the concrete one, it makes uh, the asymptotic parameters very bad. So typically for um, uh, the best FHE that we know, the ciphertext size at the end is uh, quasi-linear in the security parameter lambda. But if we want this, uh, this noise flooding technique inside our FHE, 
well, this makes the ciphertext space uh, much larger, and we need uh, cub uh, a cubic um, size ciphertext. So, um, if we if we have to picture this, the strategy corresponds basically to you. You have this uh, dirty clothing. You have a, a lot of dirt in it, and you want to get rid of it or to make it very negligible. And you will do so by flooding it inside this ocean of noise. And um, so the question is, can can we have an alternative to this where we use much less water? So can we do uh, laundry just inside a bucket? Do we actually need the whole sea? So let's try. Um, can we try to wash our ciphertext in a smaller bucket? So what if our uh, cipher the output uh, ciphertext space is kind of the same size that the input ciphertext, let's say like polynomially larger or just twice larger? So if we try to argue that this is going to be secure, how, would, how will it work? Well, now this green portion is not uh, is not, does not take uh, almost all the space. Let's say that it takes only half of the space. So with probability one half, those two ciphertexts after the noise, they will look indistinguishable in the sense that they could have come from either of them. But some ci ciphertexts will remain distinguishable. Um, so if we have a probability one half of making this work, why can't we just retry? Well, we've moved from this small ciphertext space from this big one. So if we want to retry, we have to bring our ciphertext back to the small space before retrying. So we need to send back this whole ciphertext space to this smaller one without actually affecting also the inner print text. So can we send this back, uh, this C out space to the C in? Well, actually we can, and this is how we've been building FHE for uh, seven years now, it's called the bootstrapping strategy or uh, the refreshing function. And this function is inherently present in all the FHEs that we know how to build today. So we can just rely on this. Um, more formally, uh, the strategy we, we call soak and spin is the following. So we have two polynomial time algorithm. The refresh algorithm that's given to us by the FHE we're going to build upon, refresh, sending C out to C in, and this re-randomization procedure just consisting of adding noise that sends C in back to C out. And the only assumption that we need here is that we have a soak, uh, that this uh, re-randomization function uh, follows this uh, soaking assumption. So first, we want uh, this uh, re-randomization function to not affect the underlying plain text, so the decryption after re-randomization should still be equal to the original decryption. And so this time, instead of directly asking that the statistical distance between two ciphertexts after re-randomization is negligible, we just ask that the statistical distance is less than one half or less than a constant. And from this uh, two function, we're going to define a washing cycle, so soak and spin. So the soaking is the re-randomization, and the spin is uh, the refreshing. So we're adding some water in our dirty laundry, and then we remove that water. Um, and that's, that's our cycle. And what we can prove from this assumption is that our wash function will preserve ciphertext and decrease uh, and make um, the statistical distance go to less than one half. And the amusing thing is that uh, to make it work, well, you just have to repeat this wash function lambda times. And well, by a simple induction, you can easily prove that uh, the sanitized function still preserves ciphertext, so you're not affect still preserves plain text, sorry. Um, so we're not making errors there. And more importantly, once we've applied this sanitized function, the statistical distance between any two ciphertexts that, uh, that have the same underlying plain text at the beginning, those, the statistical distance will become uh, exponentially negligible. And the proof technique is really nothing very fancy. You just have to work a little bit with splitting distributions and working with mixture of distributions. Um, so very quickly, uh, is this approach uh, actually meaningful in practice? Because bootstrapping is already very expensive. 
and we have to apply it lambda times. Well, the fact that we have to apply it lambda times is only theoretical. It's like because we just assume this very weak uh, property that uh, each iteration of our uh, re-randomization was just introducing this one half bond on the statistical distance. But if you actually look at the parameters that are given for either HLib or the few uh, fully homomorphic encryption schemes, uh, you have actually much more room for re-randomization here, and you can decrease the, the, the statistical distance much more than just one half. You can actually decrease it by two to the minus 50 for HLib because they already have a very large bucket, and in few you have a much smaller bucket, but you can still go a bit further than just uh, one half. So uh, actually, how many wash cycles do you need to clean your ciphertext? Well, with HLib, you're just going to need two or three cycles. And with uh, refreshing or bootstrapping taking five minutes, it gives you about 10 minutes to wash your ciphertext. But in this case, you can wash like a 1,000 uh, bits of plain text at the same time. Whereas for few, well, it's uh, much faster, uh, but you're only uh, doing this for one bit at the time. So here we've done this for scheme without modification. It's actually kind of slightly a lie because those schemes don't guarantee correctness provably with overwhelming probability. So in fact, you would have to modify them a little bit. But we give those numbers as uh, an estimation of what it would cost in practice to adapt those schemes. And probably you could try to optimize those schemes for this property as well. But uh, the conclusion of, uh, of this, uh, this quick analysis is that um, sanitizing your, your ciphertext is not so impractical. It's not less practical than FHG operation themselves. You just have to do a few extra bootstrapping at the end of your computation, and you're already supposed to do a lot of bootstrapping inside your computation. Um, so let me uh, wrap up. So. Um, our main result is that noise flooding is convenient. It's uh, very easy to apply, but it leads to very inefficient schemes. And instead, we can apply an iterative strategy where we add the noise little by little. And this allows us to have much smaller parameters, so we can keep the quasi-linear ciphertext space, uh, ciphertext size for FHE. We don't have to affect our FHE asymptotically. And we can rely on much less aggressive hardness assumption if you worry about those things. Um, let me quickly mention some follow-up work uh, where um, circuit privacy is uh, improved even further, where you don't need uh, that many bootstrapping to, to make it work. But it seems to be um, so far only restricted to certain types of FHE. And also an open question that I think is interesting. So one way of getting away from the honest but curious model is to apply zero knowledge proof on the public keys. But you know that FHE has huge public keys, like several gigabytes. So can we, can we upgrade uh, to the malicious setting using uh, zero knowledge proofs? Well, in theory, yes. In practice, that might uh, still be problematic. So the question would be, can you define, can you design specialized zero knowledge proof for uh, the correctness of public keys for fully homomorphic encryption schemes? And if you uh, don't have the time to read the paper, it can be summarized very quickly. So if you need to get a clean ciphertext, you just put it in the water, you wash it, you rinse it three times. Thank you. Uh, we have some time for <laughs> comments and questions. Can you give an intuition why bootstrapping on its own doesn't work for sanitization? Pardon? Can you give an intuition why just bootstrapping doesn't work for sanitization? Um, so it, it, it's, um, how to say, um, for in terms of functionality, it seems that bootstrapping gives you exactly what you, what you want, but it's not the case because the, um, the new ciphertext 
might depend on the noise of the previous ciphertext. So uh, actually, the, the functionality of bootstrapping only guarantees something about the plain text, not about the shape of the ciphertext. It does not, uh, it does not remove relations between ciphertexts. The, the distribution that you get at the end is not independent of what you put uh, inside, unless you use the, the new techniques uh, in this follow-up paper. More questions? So, you said, I, I have one question. <laughs> you said the uh, efficiency of this sanitization is uh, almost similar to the bootstrapping. It's a, yes. Can you say more about the efficiency of this sanitization? <coughs> well, it, it, would, it would depend uh, on the, the FHC scheme that you would use, but the main cost in here is not re-randomization. Re-randomization is uh, not costly, so the, the, the main cost is really bootstrapping. So you really measure the, the efficiency of that procedure by how many bootstrapping it, it, it requires. More questions and co comments? Okay. Thanks to the speaker again.